greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, the Viceroy of Verisimilitude, the master of fun and wonder, and of course, the existential Mr. Rogers. That would be me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and this is Rob Observations, the show about something. Rob Observations, episode number 236, my God, and I want to welcome all of you, you Imagination Connoisseurs of this the Post Geek Singularity community, welcome to a Monday. Welcome to the, the the first day of the rest of your life and mine too. Unless, of course, we upload our minds to the mainframe and live digitally forever, which hasn't happened yet, but could, could, because we're imagination connoisseurs, we can indeed imagine it. I have Gilbert and Tallulah here. They're here chilling out, ladies and gentlemen. There's Tallulah like chilled out, which is nice to see. Gilbert, I've already given him cookies. I was taken to task for giving him gummy bears. Somebody said that their dogs, uh, their teeth rotted away. But I assure you, these dogs are quite well cared for. Their teeth are cleaned a lot. They eat gourmet. They eat better than we do. So, you know, Gilbert, what can I say? But anyway, uh, I want to welcome you all here to this Rob Observations show about something. And this is, of course, brought to you by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great. And if you go to their website, at getluckytiger.com. You can buy anything there, and if you use PGS for Post Geek Singularity when you check out, you get 20% off of your order, which is fantastic. I need to place another order. I'm out of their facial scrub. So, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking a lot. I think a lot about things that don't exist. To be honest, I, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time wondering and contemplating stuff that never exists. I'm one of those guys that I always feared the question from his significant other, whether it was my ex-wife, whether it was girlfriends I've had, what are you thinking? I've said that before because usually the answer I know would not be well received because usually I'm thinking about which deck, as I've said before, the bowling alley on the Enterprise is. Uh, do I remember that? Or which action figure is coming out? Or the fact that even today, I received an email that said the Hot Toys Bezpin Princess Leia in her in her hot little Bezpin dress that I've always liked, that figure has been delayed to maybe even after the first of the year. And, you know, when you have, when you're paying in installments, as one does to get Hot Toys figures, uh, it's distressing because that means you'll end up paying for that entire figure before the figure even shows up. These are the things that run through my mind, and sometimes I feel guilty. You know, I wasn't thinking about potential impeachment of the president today. I wasn't thinking about uh, anything political or, or social or anything worthwhile, anything beyond the fact that I was really just contemplating how I'm going to build my Katinga class battle cruiser. I just, I have a hankering to do so and which paints I need to get, which means I have to go to kit craft. And I'm wondering, do I need a compressor for the airbrush? What do I need to do? These are the things that I think run through my mind that really nobody wants to hear and nor do I want to admit uh, that they're going on. So what are you going to do? Another thing that I was thinking about because I received a letter was I was thinking about James Bond, my lifelong love of James Bond. The man, the myth, the character, the Ian Fleming's literary creation of James Bond. Uh, I think about James Bond a lot. And of course, obviously the other day I reported on the fact that No Time to Die has wrapped principal photography. Daniel Craig is done. And it's, it's apparently, well, I'm sure there's more second unit work to do, but essentially it's in post. And the fact that the James Bond franchise as a movie making machine really knows how to make, uh, despite the fact that we we hear about mishaps or people getting hurt or things like that, for the most part, the making of the James Bond films, once they go into production, is a pretty, uh, it, it, goes, it goes down pretty well. They make these films very quickly. They're very efficient. They really know what they're doing. Of course, uh, Bond 25, No Time to Die, will be coming out in theaters. It opens in North America on the 8th of April, and it opens in the UK a week, well, six days before, and I've always talked about doing a Observation Nation trip, or whatever you want to call it, an international sojourn, which I'm going to do. We're going to go to London, England. We're going to Old Blighty, ladies and gentlemen, with the Sheriff of Nottingham, Terry. We're going to finally meet face-to-face, -face, but we're going to go to the Leicester, to Leicester Square, to the Odeon Cinema, to see 
No Time to Die with a real proper British audience the first time it opens to the public, which I think would be on April 2nd. But it really got me thinking. I'm like, does James Bond even matter? Like, you know, uh, it was it was in 1995 where Dame Judi Dench, I think she was a dame then, but she's a she's just a dame, but you know what I mean, a grand dame. Uh, Judi Dench said to Bond, as the first female M, she said to Bond that you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War. And that always sort of stuck in my craw. Because perhaps the world has changed because we have less James Bonds in it. I understand that James Bond is not real, that James Bond is a fictional character. But the idea of, of a man or a woman that has been tasked uh, by their government, in this case, Her Majesty's government, to act with impunity to save the world, perhaps we need more of those. Um, I think that is something that maybe we could use, but we don't have that, or do we? I don't know. But I received a letter today, and I thought this letter was worth sharing because I quite liked it. This letter comes from Mark P., and this letter starts, hi, Robert. A while ago, I wrote to you my first letter in which I discussed verisimilitude and used The Dark Knight Rises as an example. I was shocked to see that you made it your main topic, but I was even more delighted by your response. Well, Mark P., once again, main topic central, son. I couldn't help it. I read this letter and you, I've been thinking about this ever since. Thanks for acknowledging my opinion while still offering me reasonable explanations that may have made me look at things differently. This time around, I'm writing to you in regards to one of my favorite franchises, James Bond. In episode 230, 235, which means yesterday, uh, it was someone implied that No Time to Die could be the last Bond movie. I have to admit this didn't shock me as much as I thought it would. Let me explain. In brief, I was first introduced to 007 in 1995's GoldenEye. I was 12 at the time and blown away. Growing up on a steady diet of Arnold, Sly, and Van Damme, I had never seen an action hero like Bond, who stayed ahead of fashion trends and insisted on staying in five-star hotels. Needless to say, I was hooked and saw all of the films. By the age of 15, I insisted that From Russia With Love was the greatest Bond movie ever. It changes now depending on my mood, but it's definitely in my top five. Let me editorialize here. I think From Russia With Love is probably the best James Bond movie in terms of being a distillation of Ian Fleming's character as Ian Fleming conceived him to be. So I am with you there. I do think From Russia With Love, for those of you who are keeping score at home or who who aren't from Russia with Love was the second Bond film made. Uh, it followed Dr. No, the debut film, which started, came out in 1962. So from Russia with Love, definitely uh, easily, I might even say it's the best James Bond movie. Now, you're not going to get a modern audience to go back and watch from Russia with Love and go, oh, absolutely, you're right. No, 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 I get it. I mean, we're talking a film from the early 1960s is never going to be considered by anybody who saw Casino Royale uh, even when they were 25 years old. People are always going to go with Casino Royale. But when I say that From Russia With Love is the best James Bond movie, I say it as in terms of a an adaptation of Ian Fleming's novel series. I think it truly is the best James Bond movie. Fast forward to today, and Bond doesn't feel like such a trendsetter. I've read books about the history of Bond, and some report that liter women literally threw themselves at Sean Connery at the premiere of Goldfinger. Bond was the man back then, but in that day and age, in the day, of, but in the day and age of the MCU and Star Wars, he certainly doesn't seem to have that main event appeal. I'd love for my favorite spy to be a big event like Endgame, but perhaps those days are long gone. Don't get me wrong, 
The movies do great numbers, but it doesn't feel like Bond is on the pop culture's radar. I'm also not sure what to make of the Daniel Craig era. He's certainly committed to the role in the past, and I absolutely love Casino Royale as a movie, but that's just it. It feels more like an Elseworlds story that should be a one-off than an actual James Bond movie. For me, the Bond movies always walk the line between fantasy and reality very well. One scene has Bond killing someone in cold blood, and then five minutes later, we see his car turn into a submarine and dive into the ocean. That would be Spy Love Me from 1977. But in Casino Royale, we no longer have the megalomaniacs who stay in their hidden fortresses, plotting to take over the world, and Bond actually says the word terrorist. Not sure if 007 has ever said that word in a previous Bond, but 9-11 probably had an impact on how we wanted to perceive a super spy in 2006. The Craig era seems confusing to me. While I love Casino, when I saw Quantum of Solace, I thought I walked into a Bourne movie. I also love me some John Wick, but I don't want to see Bond doing that stuff in No Time to Die. I guess I don't just know, I just don't know what the character's identity is anymore. Lastly, I don't know if today's society can handle 007 and all of his baggage. For me, Bond was an anti-hero. And for all the times he saved the world, you could see that he wasn't a perfect Boy Scout in the process. Of course, there's sensitivities to how Bond treats women, and I don't know how Bond can be Bond in 2020. I always took Bond's treatment towards women as a flaw. In GoldenEye, 006 points out that Bond will be a, quote, lonely star on the walls of MI6 with a funeral attended by a few lonely souls, or something of the sort. He happens to be a cold-hearted assassin with an ego, and Casino Royale even gives us a nice backstory as to why he would be jaded. And I think the women of 007, for the most part, point this out to James as they manage to hold their own whenever the characters verbally spar. Vesper certainly puts him in his place in Casino Royale, and Xenia on a top hurt more people in a bedroom than James Bond ever did. Pussy Galore, yes, the name, I get it. Judo throws Bond to the ground, and this was in 1964. But I feel like people look past this because Bond is attracted to women. What's he supposed to do in his next movie when he sees a beautiful woman? Look down at the ground and ignore her? He used to smoke, he drinks, he argues with his superiors, he thinks he's right all the time, and he'll even seduce someone if it will save queen and country. We were never told Bond was perfect, though, and I've always felt that that was what made the character so interesting. I'm not sure whether writers want to take Bond and if society will accept an anti-hero like him in today's climate. I'd love your thoughts on the matter. That comes from Mark P. Well, Mark P., I love this letter um, because James Bond was the first, look, a, yes, Star Trek for me was my first love, but Star Trek wasn't on the big screen when I was a little kid. James Bond was. The first James Bond movie I ever saw was Spy Who Loved Me, and I loved it. And what I find really interesting, if I might delve into a subject matter that we don't normally cover here on our none of the really none of the geek pundits do and i think there's a reason for that uh is sex we don't talk about sex and one of the things that both classic star trek and james bond instilled in me was the love and desire for beautiful women i mean when i was a kid even though I was a kid, one of the great appeals, I'm not going to lie, was the women of Star Trek. If you watch classic Star Trek, the women were beautiful, the clothes were amazing, and they were, let's call them very feminine looking. They were not, they were busty, they were hippie, they were, they were, they were beautiful, and they were very feminine. Same was true of the James Bond franchise. And what I found interesting to me growing up is that Captain Kirk and James Bond, uh, they were both, well, they were both ladies' men. 
and I I thought in my mind at the time that that was part of the appeal of those franchises. I I always I always considered James Kirk and James Bond sensualists. Bond certainly was. I mean, he loved he loved his sensual pleasures. He didn't just love beautiful women. As I said yesterday, he liked uh, a bottle of champagne chilled to the perfect temperature. He loved beluga caviar. He loved his martinis shaken and not stirred because he didn't want his uh, alcohol bruised. So the thing about James Bond was, was he was a sensualist. He loved the pleasures of the flesh. And part of that was, you know, beautiful women. Now you brought up in your letter things like the MCU and Star Wars. There are two mo monster franchises. I love Star Wars, but Star Wars is probably, as far as sci-fi goes, one of the most chaste franchises ever. Um, the idea that there are very few women in Star Wars. You saw very few women. I remember, you know, when I remember seeing Star Wars, there's like, those two twin alien girls in Moss Eisley that are checking Luke out. And I was thinking, yeah, why don't you go talk to them? You know, and it, it's been really interesting how, how, how sexuality has been bled out of these major franchises. The MCU certainly, I mean, of course, Hawkeye is married, but the idea, do we know that Captain, we've, we've seen Captain America kiss one girl, I think. Well, two, if you include the end of Endgame, I guess. Um, it's just a strange thing that genre entertainment, uh, there's some, you know, you watch The Expanse, there's things like that. They're, of course, obviously Firefly, but not a big component. Whereas James Bond, you know, he sleeps with, I, I mean, I remember when Living Daylights came out, the big deal was because Living Daylights came out in 1987, we now lived in a post-AIDS world a lot was made of the fact that James Bond only slept with one woman in the whole movie. And, and I think that's sort of, you know, today, the idea that James Bond, uh, like you said, is not, he, he will seduce a woman uh, for king and country unapologetically. It, they, they're definitely, James Bond sees women in, let's just say, uh, not... He, he, he he's not exactly he's not exactly the most liberated of men when it comes to seeing women as equals. However, when he does work with we we've seen Y Lin in Tomorrow Never Dies, we've seen of course Anya Masava, Triple X in Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, he's not beyond working with with powerful women. Of course, Octopussy and her private army. Uh, there's there's all kinds of it, it's very interesting when you when you get into all of that, uh, but definitely I don't think that his attitude toward women would necessarily fly today, especially amongst genre fandom. Uh, the the genre fan audience traditionally, I mean, it's very interesting. I've always thought that genre fans have been. We still have very much a, a strange relationship with sexuality in our genre fandom. Um, it, it's it's either been front and center and kind of weird, like with the Society for Creative Anachronisms, <laughs> or there, there's been some very there's a lot of alternative lifestyle stuff. It's say Dragon Con, and but it's 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 very I don't know it's very weird. It's always been sort of very. It's never. It's never just a part of the DNA. It's already are, of anything. It's always sort of set apart, set on on the side. Whereas James Bond has always flaunted uh, the sexuality uh, of women, and definitely it, it is a an age. Bond comes from a bygone era. You know, when you watch John Hamm as as his character in Mad Men, he jumps in and out of bed. It's unbelievable. I mean, he was the James Bond of the of the ad of the Mad Men era, and, and I mean, I don't I don't know if anyone's ever calculated exactly how many women John Hamm's character slept with in Mad Men, but it's a lot. And there was this. I didn't live. I mean, I was born in the late '60s. I didn't live through the late '60s, so 
it, there was all like you said that people used to throw women used to throw themselves at Sean Connery. You watch women screaming and yelling for the Beatles. It's a different. It was just a different era, and that's not the only era. Like you pointed out, it's the smoking, it's the drinking, uh, it all of the sensual pleasures. Bond was a fiend for these things, and I think it never. When I was growing up, I just assumed that James Bond was always close to death. Um, on any mission, he knew he was going to die. So he he lived on the edge. I mean, they would even there was even a, a ad campaigns to that effect for the James Bond franchise. So his voracious appetites, whether it was for women, whether it was for drinking, whether it was for smoking, or whether it was just for the action, the adrenaline, I always saw that as a function of the character that he was one step away from dying. And uh, he knew that any mission he was going to go on would be his last. And he had to be a certain kind of a person in order to do that job. And like you pointed out, I think, I think Mark, you, you, you astutely pointed out in your letter that the character of James Bond always skirted fantasy and reality. And if you watch the first Bond films, indeed, Dr. No from Russia with Love, Goldfinger, and Thunderball, to a certain extent. There is a lot of reality in those films, but the characters, I mean, Red Grant is almost a superhuman assassin in From Russia with Love, are at Goldfinger, and and there, there's things like Odd Job is is unnaturally strong. He has his top hat that has a is a bladed weapon that can take the head off a cement statue. I mean, even though it's set in the real world, there's always this element of pulp fantasy that's in the James Bond movies. And especially in the Connery era, it really it really sort of skirted that. Of course, then as we got into Thunderball, you had airplanes that were landing in the there there were there were landing fields underneath the ocean that a plane could see and then land and it would sink to the bottom and then <laughs> divers would get out the the nukes. Or, or you would have a boat that could come apart. But it was all, I mean, it was they did. They built a practical boat that could come apart. So it felt like, oh, yeah, this could be real. And then, of course, when we got to 1967 and you only live twice, there's a, there is a base inside a, a, a dormant volcano. There are spaceships swallowing other spaceships in orbit and bringing them into that base. And the idea of reality started to be, be pushed. And what's interesting, Honor Majesty's Secret Service sort of pulled that back and made it more realistic. But then again, by the time you you go from 69 to 77, you've got an underwater city that Carl Stromberg has created. And by 79, Hugo Drax has created an orbiting platform and has has a <laughs> a, a entire launch site in the middle of the Amazon. And even when I saw that movie, I'm like, how did they get the construction team there to build that base, that that amazing base in the Amazon? How did they get, I, even then, I was like, nah, I don't know. Then, of course, what they did in 81 was they pulled the franchise back in For Your Eyes Only and stripped it down to its essence again. So, and now with the Daniel Craig era, they've gotten rid of almost all of the fantasy elements of the story because... Hey, when you have real world events such as terrorists flying planes into buildings, the world went and became a Bond movie. So it's interesting to me. I feel you. I I used to I couldn't wait for James Bond movies to open when I was a kid. They were my favorite, they're my favorite things. I mean, yeah, I loved Star Wars, of course, and and the big science fiction movies, but for the most part, Star Wars, when it first came out, was a one-off. We didn't know if there was ever going to be another Star Wars movie. Remember, Star Wars opened in 1977 along with, quite soon after, or maybe at the same time, almost concurrently, The Spy Who Loved Me opened in theaters as well. And the next James Bond movie, Moonraker, came out a year before The Empire Strikes Back did. So the Bond franchise was good every two years. Uh, there was a James Bond movie. The only time in in my most of my life that there was a drought was the six years between License to Kill and GoldenEye 
in the mid '90s. You went '89 was License to Kill, and there was another, not another James Bond movie till 1995 because of legal the Kevin McClory legal rigmarole that have been have been uh, with the franchise since it's since it started in '62. So it was, you know, it, it was something that I feel now that yes, characters like John Wick inhabit a fantasy world. To me, John Wick. I, I love the first John Wick movie, and I've liked John Wick two and three, but the first film with this hint of this larger world with the Continental and all that, I liked that because John Wick felt real. Now it's of course sort of gone into the fantasy realm, whereas James Bond, uh, I don't think kids grow up with any sense of James Bond. I mean, sure they might go see the movies, but. When I was growing up as a little kid, James Bond movies were an event, whether they were in the theaters or when I first saw them, they were on the ABC Sunday Night Movie, and it was a big deal. And every kid would watch James Bond. You know, it wasn't something. And and now, with as you pointed out, with Bourne, with with all the other heroes that we have uh, in movie theaters today, James Bond has sort of been supplanted. And what people forget is. Even in the early 60s, uh, when, in 1962, when Dr. No opened, most people in the world were not flying in je on jets, transcontinental flights across the ocean. They were not going to Monaco and, and, and playing Baccarat. They weren't doing these things. So the James Bond films were showing most middle-class people, and it, certainly in America, the middle class had been built over the last... A uh, little over 15 years after the end of World War II, the middle class was being built, and and the middle class hadn't really existed before, and so the James Bond movies were wish fulfillment. You had this debonair secret agent who was virile and manly, and who was a former naval commander and was saving the world. So he appealed to women, and he was he was always dressed in the best tuxes and did understand what champagne to buy. So he was very attractive to women, but he was also very attractive to men because all men wanted to be James Bond. And he was wish fulfillment for everybody. And it, the James Bond movies, people, we weren't alive, so we won't remember this, but when a Bond movie would come out, it would play for 24 hours. It was the Avengers of its day. By the time Goldfinger opened, the Bond franchise was one of the most successful franchises anyone had ever seen. The, the character's worldwide popularity was monstrously huge. And now, not so much. And, you know, Bond set trends. Uh, the Bond films were were all about that. And it was it was as much a lifestyle brand as it was a movie character or, or, or a series of films. And indeed, magazines like Playboy Became, became popularized. I mean, if Playboy could have taken James Bond on as a mascot, and indeed, indeed, James Bond kind of was a a mascot for for the Playboy brand, even though maybe not directly. But it, it's interesting to see now the Bond franchise exist where it exists because I don't think the Bond franchise. It doesn't even set trends as far as action is concerned. The James Bond franchise was showing people things they had never seen. There was the car chases, whether James Bond was 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 skiing down a mountain or jumping off. I mean, the 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 sequence at the beginning of the Spy Who Loved Me, where James Bond flies off a cliff and the Union Jack opens up, and you hear the Bond theme song before Carly Simon sings "Nobody Does It Better." There was really a guy who skied off a cliff with a with a parachute. There was no CG. People did it. You know, in 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 the the in, when the glass drawn boat jumps across the river in in Live and Let Die, that happened. The flying car in in um, Man with the Golden Gun. All of those things were real. I mean, they weren't real. They were constructed for the movie, but they they did them practically. So that was part of the, the appeal of the Bond franchise. So now, I just, unfortunately, the world has changed. And when, when Judy Dench called Bond that sexist, misogynist dinosaur in GoldenEye, that was a statement of fact. And that was something that we 
as moviegoers understood it was true. Uh, we 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 then lived in a world, you know, it was really interesting. In 81, you had Raiders of the Lost Ark opening very quickly within a matter of weeks with For Your Eyes Only. And, you know, you watched those films and Raiders of the Lost Ark announced itself. This was a new franchise. This was, even though it was a throwback to the serials of the 40s, 30s and 40s, the movie serials of the 30s and 40s, there was something new about it. Indiana Jones was the new James Bond. And if you were a kid, if you were a kid going to the movies in 1981, what would you rather go see, For Your Eyes Only or Raiders of the Lost Ark? Now, I was very excited to see For Your Eyes Only as a, a newly minted 14-year-old. But I also, because it was Bond, and I love Bond, but Raiders of the Lost Ark blew me away. And the, the there was no politics. There was no Cold War in Indiana Jones. It was a period piece. So we all knew that Nazis are generically bad people, bad, the, perhaps the best villains of all time. But there was, there was, you know, I didn't look at, I didn't, I didn't look at James Bond and think I could never live up to that guy because James Bond was real, whereas Indiana Jones was a fantasy character. It's just a very interesting, very interesting thing. And it's, I guess, as I've gotten older, and for me, the Daniel Craig era has provided one movie. Uh, I, I loved Casino Royale. Quantum of Solace, I actually am a, an apologist for, but Skyfall, I know, people like Skyfall. Skyfall, and especially Spectre, did not do it for me. And uh, I was not a big fan of either of those movies, even though I, the last time I went to see a James Bond movie in London, I went to see the opening of Skyfall. I was very disappointed with that film because I thought it was nonsensical, and it was the first time I saw a movie where James Bond failed to, he failed to achieve anything in that film. And then his major objective was to keep M alive. He failed at that too. And I didn't understand what they were trying to accomplish with Skyfall. But anyway, I was thinking about the Bond franchise a lot. Does the Bond franchise still matter today? Um, have we moved beyond the Bond franchise? Do kids, would young boys or young girls grow up and watch the James Bond franchise and find anything of value in it? I don't know. And to be honest, I don't think so. You know, I don't think if I was six or seven or eight years old watching James Bond movies, I don't know if they would appeal to me. Uh, I don't know. if if I mean, if I was a kid of today, they certainly did when I was growing up. Because I have to tell you, to me, James Bond and Captain Kirk were sort of kind of the same genre of guy. And I wanted to be both of them. I wanted to be both Kirk and I wanted to be James Bond. And this was when I was a kid. I was a little kid. And I I just, I can't imagine little kids today. When I say little kid, I'm talking six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, you know. And Kirk and Bond were my heroes. And it's interesting to think, wow, would you want your seven-year-old kid to be worshiping at the altar of James Bond movies? I don't know. Does that make this world a better world or not? Uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting thing. I, I, I just don't know. And I, it's worth, I think it's worth considering. I think it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an inch. I, I would think not the Bond film. I mean, Skyfall did make a billion dollars up until Spider-Man far from home. It was the most successful film Sony had ever released. So people still love Bond. They still do. The idea of Bond is there. Anyway, uh, Timula, or first of all, uh, let's see. Well, Jordy54. Wow, there's actually there's a lot of people here. Uh, I didn't realize that there were so many people. Word balloon. John Suntress is here. Bond at its best is about exotic locales, hard action, beautiful people, and a charismatic villain who should be powerful enough to challenge him. I agree. You know, I agree, but it's 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 like all of those things now, I I guess. I hate the idea that James Bond would be considered the poster boy for toxic masculinity. When I would say that mas his ma his brand of masculinity has saved the world many times over. Um, you know, I, I think now when I whenever I hear the the term and I, I, I'm just like, well, okay, if there was no James Bond, the world would have ended. And whose fault would it be? <laughs> whose fault would it be? 
John Suntress's Word Balloon podcast, by the way, I highly recommend it. Whenever he writes in, I got to remind you that the Word Balloon podcast is tremendous and you should listen to it. Uh, Stephen Foley says, hey, Rob, do you believe in the panspermia theory that life on Earth originated from microorganisms or chemical precursors of life present in outer space and able to initiate life on reaching a suitable environment? Well, that's an interesting question. So for those of you who don't know, the idea that, look, all of the building blocks of life that, that compose all of life on this planet can be found in, as Carl Sagan would say, star stuff. And uh, whether it's carbon, whether it's wh wh whatever, all of the, the building blocks of life that are on this planet exist elsewhere in the universe. But we still don't understand what was that, what was the, what was the first cause? I don't know. But I would assume that eventually, because however the Earth itself came here, or whether it was a uh, rock that was ejected from our star, whatever, whatever, whatever caused this to happen, all of all, you would say that panspermia was the cause of everything uh, in terms of our solar system, planets. We all, we are all our star stuff. You know, I, 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 I do tend to believe that. I don't know if first that living organisms arrived on Earth through whether it's meteors or whatever. Um, I, I think it could. I think panspermia could be true, but I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I would like to believe that that, that could be possible, though. Um, but then again... Maybe, maybe with the right, you, you, you know, look, we cook things. You put, you put ingredients together, you cook things up and they taste good. Suddenly you create something that didn't exist. Um, why can't that have happened? I mean, the idea of life being made out of the building blocks of star stuff, if there's the right pressure, the right heat, I think maybe that could happen too. Um, I don't necessarily think it has to have come from outer space from somewhere else because eventually it had to have evolved from something or somewhere or, or maybe maybe life, you know, with the right amount of pressure and the right amount of heat. Who knows? I don't know. That's interesting. Stubble McShave says, Rob, it was funny to see your spatial. <laughs> Rob, it was funny to see your facial expression when John Campia professed his love for the Force Awakens today. Yes, you know, I, I sometimes have to, I, I find myself catching myself and my expressions uh, when John says things. I mean, I know he loves Force Awakens. I, of course, do not. I don't think it's a very a particularly great film. I th certainly think it's not a very well-written movie, and it's in the service of many masters. So, uh, I, you know, when he says he loves Force Awakens, I understand why he does, but I don't think he really loves Force Awakens. I think he wants to love Force Awakens, and it's a different thing. Uh, Jeffrey Mao says, Campion needs to read my The Empire Strikes Back timeline letter. Yes, and I did I? I've read it. I've read it, obviously read it, but look, for those of you who don't know, John was talking about how Luke doesn't have training as a Jedi, and I was talking about how, in my mind, and keep in mind, I saw Empire Strikes Back 26 times. I, I see... The Empire Strikes Back as taking place over a number of months. Actually, you you when we meet the rebels on Hoth, they've been there for a while. They've been chased out of their home on on the moon of Yavin, and they've relocated to Hoth. So you have that happening, and there's there's time. I mean, Luke was wounded by the Wampa. Was it just overnight? I assume that days, maybe a week. Who knows how long he was in that back to tank. I assume that The Empire Strikes Back is showing us a very compressed version because a lot of what goes on is boring. And then how long does it take for the Millennium Falcon to be pursued? Uh, people seem to think it's... It, I've never understood that it's it's not real time. I thought Luke was on Dagobah training with Yoda for months. And I thought that because the hyperdrive on the Millennium Falcon was damaged. 
So when they're looking around for a place to travel, the Millennium Falcon is traveling at sublight speed and the nearest system is not right next door. I assumed it probably took months for the Millennium Falcon to travel to Bespin. That was the closest port of call. And when you're traveling in space, that's just par for the course. And the time that it took for the Millennium Falcon to get to Bespin, uh, that was all Luke on Dagobah also for months training with Yoda. And I, I didn't think it was a day or an afternoon. I mean, it was an intense intensive Jedi training course that Luke was undergoing. That's how I, that's how I always uh, assumed. I mean, John was saying, no, it took place in a day. He landed. And I'm like, no, because you're watching Luke's evolution. By the time he's standing on one hand and can balance Yoda on his foot and rocks are coming up, that took a long time to master. That didn't happen in a day. So I've always seen The Empire Strikes Back as a film that took place over months, many months. Six months, whatever. Uh, that's the way I've always seen it. So, Jeff, yes. Yes, sir. Jordy54 says, the Irish government are putting in 33 million euros to boost the film industry. Can I just command them that we leave the EU and hide under our beds? Hashtag Brexit. Well, you know, I hope not. I mean, look, we're going through an evolutionary period of time across the planet, whether... China has to figure out what they're doing. I mean, they've allowed they've allowed capitalism to flourish under a communist system, which is interesting. Uh, what's going on with traveling populations and immigrant populations? You've the 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 European the West that is Europe is now dealing with an influx of people that are not part of the West that have different belief systems. How are they going to absorb those people? How are they going to deal with the different belief systems? And it is a clash of cultures and we're, we're going to see in the rest of the 21st century an evolutionary period of time. I, I'm fairly optimistic about it. I think, you know, we'll figure it out. It's going to be painful, I think, but we will figure it out. Um, and I think the Irish film industry, we had obviously animation was big for a while. Why not? I mean, I've never actually been to Ireland. I'd like to go maybe next, maybe when I go to um, see No Time to Die, I will make it finally over to Ireland and see as many distilleries as I can. But I, I, you know, I think we're in an evolutionary period of time where everybody, we're all, all of us, cultures are, nation states are, ideologies are, people are, the, certainly the environment is. Uh, we're, we're in a, a major evolutionary period of time. And, and I hope that cool heads prevail because now whatever happens, it affects everybody on the planet. And we have that in real time and we can watch watch it occur so hopefully we'll pull our head out of our collective asses and do the right thing djc do1 says hey rob do you think shows like knight rider was loosely based off of james bond they do reference at least one time on the fourth season i feel like james bondesque driving my knight rider kit i, I do feel like james bond you're you're driving your knight rider kit wait a minute I, there's only one person that I know who actually has a Knight Rider kit. If that's you, it must be you, right? Um, uh, an old friend, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, sending me a, a super chat. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, I do. I, I, I think that, I think that any, I do think that any, um, uh, any sort of secret agent, I mean, you can't not look at a car like Kit with with his his Cylon light in the front and not think about James Bond. Any cool car, any souped up car, especially Knight Rider was an early 80s, early 80s, I think. Uh, uh, absolutely, it was inspired by James Bond. I mean, James Bond would have had Kit. They've never actually, they probably never put an AI in a car that James Bond drove simply because somebody would have said, "Oh no, no, that that that's that's Knight Rider, that's Knight Rider." Mm. But thank you for supporting the channel. I feel James Bond esque driving my Knight Rider kit car. All right, there's only one person I know who that can be, and you know I know. <laughs> so yes, I do think that's true. I do think that's absolutely true. 
Uh, I think any, any, yes, yes. The answer is yes. Timbula the Spider Monkey. I was going to send you a super chat about Bond and other franchises I've fallen out of love with, but realized it would end up costing hundreds of dollars. I'll send a letter about it instead, but here, have some dollars. <laughs> well, Tim, Timbula the Spider Monkey is a long time member of this, the Post Geek Singularity community, and uh, written some great letters and also incorporates his lovely, significant, they say partner in Australia. You don't say girlfriend or boyfriend, you say partner. Same, the Kiwis say partner as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, look, the problem, we've talked about this a lot on the show. The, the problem with all of these franchises is that now they are simply, there, there is an imbalance between the art and the commerce of them all. And a lot of these franchises that are being resurrected, are, are they're, they're trying to figure out what can we make money from? And they forget the reason, the reason that franchises, it's the same reason you can't create a cult movie. Rocky Horror Picture Show became a cult. Uh, if you watch uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, a movie I particularly, I, I quite enjoy, Criterion just put out Hedwig, uh, Hedwig and they, uh, John Cameron Mitchell's Hedwig and the Angry Inch, great, great movie, created a cult around it. Um, and you, you, there's a great documentary that Criterion ported over to that Blu-ray where you can see that cult developing. It shows how Hedwig found an audience. And the same is true. You can't, I, I feel that Star Trek is suffering from this. I feel like uh, they've been trying to make Star Trek happen again. They didn't do it with the three feature films, regardless of what you might think. Neither Star Trek 09 into darkness or even star trek beyond were hugely successful they were very expensive movies for the amount of money that they made they spent a lot of money marketing those movies especially into darkness and they 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 didn't re-energize that franchise star trek discovery they were hoping just like they hoped that star trek voyager would help launch the upn network and indeed it's star indeed it started out doing so but star trek discovery has not energized a fan base or been incredibly successful they're, and now what they're they're doing is star trek picard i think is exciting but uh, uh, again you're going back and and star trek is not reinventing itself star trek 09 let's go back and bring back kirk spock and mccoy and show us show the world those characters the thing is ultimately they can't show you kirk spock and mccoy again because those characters aged out they're gone you know, you 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 can go back and sure you can you can reinvigorate things like that, but not when it's not when it's like it's the same reason you cannot go back. And we saw it with Star Wars. You can't go back and replace Harrison Ford as Han Solo. You can't do it. You can't do it with a franchise. There, there. I mean, you you can, but it's not going to be successful because the character of Han Solo, you put him in The Force Awakens, so from 1977 to 2015, which is a big chunk of time, if you include, I mean, it's really interesting that you've got corporations with people that are working in these corporations that were were not even around when when the character of Han Solo was introduced, and that character, Han Solo, was, was, wasn't was was changed in from 1977 to 2015. Harrison Ford was the only Han Solo there ever was. Just like Kirk Spock McCoy, I mean, from 1966, Kirk died in, in 94, so that was the better part of three decades. And then, of course, Spock, you even put Spock in Star Trek 09, and when you put Spock in Star Trek 09, you have, you have Zachary Quinto and you have Leonard Nimoy. There's no authenticity. What you've done is I liked it from a fan perspective, but if you're trying to reinvigorate a franchise, you're showing... So you're showing side by side the real McCoy, so to speak, and then a character that's not really that character, and you're comparing them on the same. Can you imagine if Alden Enreich and and um, and and Harrison Ford shared the screen, and they were both supposed to be Han Solo? It doesn't work. And when you try and do that, that's why. That's why I gotta say I go back to Creed again. I go back to Creed. You have a universe. You have the Rocky franchise. Rocky is Rocky. Rocky is still, he, he's in his, I guess in, in Creed, he was in his early 70s. You have new characters to go forward and continue that franchise. 
You know, you can't go back. You can't go back and recast somebody as Rocky Balboa because the whole franchise began at a certain period of time. It began in the mid seventies and captured the zeitgeist and then stayed in the zeitgeist for a long period of time. You can't then go back and go, here's the new Rocky Balboa. There can only ever be one. Sure, maybe in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or whatever, you could go back and remake Rocky with somebody else. But Sylvester Stallone, is ne you're never going to get, at least now, you're never going to get our pop culture zeitgeist to embrace another character playing Rocky Balboa. That's why Solo didn't work. Solo is a perfectly acceptable film. Perhaps not a great movie, but it's a pretty good movie. But it's you're looking at this going that isn't that's not han solo and i think that's why i always have said putting ewan mcgregor in a star wars movie even though he wasn't obi-wan kenobi ewan mcgregor even when he was cast as obi-wan kenobi people are like oh my god that's great and he was in the prequel trilogy so obi-wan kenobi as a young obi-wan alec guinness as an older obi-wan that worked you might ask yourself well why didn't because because Al Guinness didn't exist anymore, you know? And, and so having a young Obi-Wan Kenobi was the only thing you could do, and we bought off on it. But when you have Harrison Ford in The Force Awakens, and a couple years later you watch a young, you watch a young Han Solo when Harrison Ford's still alive, well, I mean, unless you do it in the same movie and, and, and show that here's young Han Solo and then, then draw the line the way you did with River Phoenix and Indiana Jones... I, I just think the problem with these franchises is the only reason they're being revived is because of money. That's it. And, and what you're doing then is the people that have the money, they have an agenda. They're like, okay, it has to be this. You have to make this franchise like this. And if you're doing it, then you're, 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 you've lost because, because you're trying to appeal to a fan base that, that loves these things and you need to have part of, you need somebody, that's why I say Ryan Coogler, talented filmmaker who loved Rocky, loved Rocky, had an idea, had to pitch Stallone. And the only way you could have made Rocky is if that, those characters came from somebody that loved the Rocky franchise. Kevin Feige, because he worked for Marvel, he was able to shape the MCU because he loves the MCU. Everybody else is trying to, well, we'll hire this creator who made this movie. Now, that movie might not have anything to do with this, but but the 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 trying to get a franchise, trying to make it happen again by, by allowing the people who've bought the franchise, who don't necessarily love the franchise, or who really understand the franchise, even if you hire people at the corporate level who supposedly do understand the franchise they're not the filmmakers you got to find the filmmakers you got to find the people that love these franchises otherwise it's never going to work and and you're going to end up with with um look everybody says they love star wars there's no filmmaker in hollywood that doesn't love star wars but you know jj abrams is a businessman he's making a, a ton of money and and it, he was perhaps a a good hire but you know, you hamstrung even him. He had to do what what Disney corporately mandated. If you read, I think the big the big takeaway from Bob Iger's book, and if you've read the excerpts about Star Wars, is when Disney bought Star Wars, they knew they had to make it the most familiar kind of Star Wars of all. Well, that is completely wrong and completely mistaken because look at how Empire Strikes Back works with Star Wars. Empire Strikes Back is a very different movie than Star Wars. It touches different buttons. That's the kind of thinking we've got to we've got to work within the franchise, but we've got to make it new and exciting and fresh. It's not what they did with Force Awakens. And it's interesting because Last Jedi tried to do something new. But I don't think Last Jedi, I mean, there's a lot of colloquial humor, for instance. The idea of the whole putting somebody on hold, that whole idea. Uh, it was weird. Colloquial humor collo doesn't have any place in Star Wars. So there's things about Last Jedi, even though I liked Last Jedi, there's things about it. I understand why it didn't really work. Star Wars itself is not colloquial and it's timeless. They, they basically made something out of time. And if you watch it now, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you put colloquial humor in it that's based on the here and now, you undercut your verisimilitude of the Star Wars universe. 
So, uh, anyway, so Timula, the Spider Monkey, Tim, I have to say that that I think that's the problem. Once these franchises become franchises, what they are is then dictated by the people that are not basing what the franchise should be on what it is, but rather than the money it's supposed to generate. And there's already an expectation that there's an audience there. It's like trying to make a cult movie before you've actually made the film. You can't set out to make a cult movie because a cult movie is something that, that emerges and evolves naturally because of the audience. The franchise, a franchise is the same thing. You know, a franchise wasn't a franchise. When Star Wars came out, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg lit off to Hawaii thinking it was going to be a huge disaster. And for whatever reason, Star Wars caught on. It was a zeitgeist. So it's a wonderful movie, obviously. But it caught on. Now, you know, when you sit there and go, okay, you're just going to take it for granted that the Star Wars franchise is always going to be successful. That way lies death. And, and we're watching these franchises who are controlled by corporations whose desire is to, oh, it's a franchise. Let's use it to make a lot of money. You know, let's have an anim let's have two animated series. Let's do the card show. Let's do Discovery Season 3 instead of a thousand years in the future. All this stuff. Well, okay. You know, Picard came, the idea from the Picard show came from Kirsten Beyer, from what I, from what I understand, who is, in fact, a Star Trek fan. You know, she's been on the writing staff of Discovery. She's going to be the first person and has been the first person marginalized in the writer's room by everybody else. And yet she's probably, if you've read any of Kirsten Byers' Star Trek novels, believe it or not, if her Voyager Star Trek novels are all very, very good. She has a very, a, a, a very good understanding of the franchise and she should be the person leading the charge. And yet I'm sure, you know, not so much. But anyway, um, Stubble McShave says, do you think Moonraker would exist if not for Star Wars? Oh, I think they would have made Moonraker, but it would have it would have uh, uh, been much closer to Fleming's novel. I think if it wasn't for Star Wars, no, they wouldn't have gone out into space. Star Wars was it, it, it caused all the rage. I mean, it, it, it touched off not just imitators like the Japanese made message from space. My beloved Italian star crash. There was all kinds of Star Wars imitators. Why shouldn't the Bond franchise go into space? But again, that was James Bond chasing a trend all through the 70s. That's all Bond did. The James Bond movies of the 60s set trends. The Bond movies of the 70s chase them. Live and Let Die chased black exploitation. Mouth Golden Gun chased martial arts. Spy Who Loved Me was a transitional movie that I thought really worked well. I mean, it was great. But then Moonraker was a remake of Spy Who Loved Me chasing Star Wars. And then, of course, the 80s were basically a time where Bond, they had to try and redefine Bond, and it was rehashing stuff we'd already seen. License to Kill, again, basically, let's make a, a, a theatrical version of a Miami Vice episode. Uh, Octopussy, For Your Eyes Only, and Living Daylights were attempts to bring, and View to a Kill, were attempts to figure out what to do with the Bond character, but he was showing his age, literally, by the time you get to view to a kill. Um, yeah. Stubble McShave says the Persuaders uh, with Roger Moore had the best intro music. They did. That was pretty badass. A lot of, there's a lot of, of all of the British, not all, but a lot of the British shows of the 60s had some, and 70s, have some incredible theme music. And I've always wondered why that is. I mean, look, everyone knows my love of UFO and Space 1999. Barry Gray killing it with those themes. Ron Grenier's theme for, for uh, Doctor Who and The Prisoner. It's great stuff. Uh, Geron Gillam says, Sam Mendes' new film, 1917, is a one-shot movie. Okay, for those who don't know, well, so Sam Mendes, who directed Skyfall and who directed, um, uh, he directed Spectre, uh, he he also directed American Beauty and Road to Perdition. He has a new movie coming out called 1917 that I, apparently is based on a story that his grandfather used to tell about World War I. And they've made it look a la Birdman. They've made it look like it's all one shot. Even though they use editorial tricks, it's not all one shot. But it's made to look like it's all one shot, like Birdman. And it's supposedly incredible. Um, 
I, uh, I, I think that, um, uh, I think it looks fantastic, but remember, it's not all one shot, but it's made to look like it is. Can't wait to see it. Uh, it should be great. Willow Yang asks, what's your favorite suggestive Bond girl name? Well, for those of you who have been living under a rock, uh, a lot of the James Bond uh, female characters, the antagonists or protagonists in Bond movies, have cheeky, so to speak, names. Uh, Dr. Holly Goodhead from Moonraker. Um, Octopussy herself. Xenia on a top. Uh, you know, Pussy Galore, obviously. There, there are many. Uh, Holly, uh, the uh, Mary Goodnight. Uh, I, who is my favorite? Um, you know, I gotta say because I love Goldfinger. I mean, I gotta go with the the queen of the suggestive Bond titles, which is Pussy Galore, and uh, who's basically a lesbian. And I, 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 I remember when I was a kid, I knew I couldn't even say that name aloud, and it would. Uh, at the scene when they when Bond first hears her name is hysterical, and I yeah I've got to go with Honor Blackman's Pussy Galore, because why not? Um, <laughs> DJ CD zero one says that's me that has the kit. I do like the James Bond bike, but it wasn't an official James Bond film. I think you're talking about the bike from Never Say Never Again that Bond rides. Great bike. I love that bike. Never Say Never Again is, of course, a remake of Thunderball that Kevin Mc... Thunderball was supposed to be the first James Bond movie. There is a... If you can ever find a copy of a book called The Battle for Bond, I think it was pulled, but uh, I have it. Uh, it's really interesting. It's all about the Kevin McClory situation, how Kevin McClory was an Ian Fleming and Albert Broccoli and Cubby Broccoli, all sort of the inception of the Bond film franchise. Thunderball was going to be the first Bond film. Uh, there was a lot of rigmarole that went on that, that that made it so it wasn't, but very, very interesting. Um, very interesting story. But yes, so Kevin McClory was able to remake Thunderball as Never Say Never Again in 1983. In 1983, we had two Bond films coming out. You had the original, the official Bond film, which was Octopussy, which was Roger Moore's penultimate Bond film, uh, obviously followed by View to a Kill, his last his last, and he was 55, I think, when he played Bond in that movie. And he looked it. And uh, uh, I love the motorcycle in, in um, you know, Willow, it's not really suggestive, but I really liked Fatima Blush, Barbara Carrera's Fatima Blush. I just thought the name Fatima Blush was really cool. Um, write that the greatest rapture of your life was afforded to you in a boat in Nassau with Fatima Blush. And Bond says, um, we can't give out endorsements. Agents can't give out endorsements. <laughs> it's one of the, it's so great. Um, but yeah, the, the, the bike, the bike in never say never again is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, yeah. Cardinal sin says spy TV shows and movies were popular from the early sixties up to the present day. The original casino Royale was an episode of TV with Peter Laurie and they played Baccarat. Wild Wild West, Man from Uncle, I Spy. By the way, Cardinal Sin is correct. For those of you who don't know, the first time James Bond was portrayed on screen uh, was Barry Nelson played Bond. And for those of you who might wonder, who is Barry Nelson? Well, because tomorrow's October and The Shining is coming out on 4K, Barry Nelson was the guy who hires Jack Nicholson in The Shining. <laughs> He's the first guy that played Jimmy Bond, and it was shot on videotape. And it was done as an hour-long episode for American television, which, by the way, you can get on Blu-ray. I own it on Blu-ray. I have the original Casino Royale. The 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 2006 Casino Royale. It's 2006? Uh, the 2006 Casino Royale is actually the third version of Casino Royale that was made. There's that TV version that was made. There's the movie from 67, the comedic parody of James Bond movies with Woody Allen and David Niven. And then there is, of course, the Casino Royale that was made, uh, the first Daniel Craig Bond movie. But yes, so in the 60s, what Cardinal Sin is referring to, the Wild Wild West was literally a James Bond-esque show with Robert Conrad. I actually have the box set of all the Wild Wild West episodes on DVD. I love Wild Wild West. Wild Wild West was a Western spy 
show that also skewed towards science fiction a little bit. And I love Wild Wild West. And I Spy, which is another Robert Culp and Bill Cosby, Man from Uncle with Robert Vaughn uh, as, Ilya, uh, as Napoleon Solo and Ilya Kuryakin, his Russian sidekick. Uh, yes, there was all, and they, they weren't the only ones. There was, a, there was a slew, the Matt Helm movies that, that are one of them that Sharon Tate was in that's cited. You see clips from it in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You had the uh, Flint movies with James Coburn. I mean, the Bond films had a slew, set off a whole genre of both spy thrillers on TV and in the theaters. So, yeah, uh, even to the present day, I mean, Jason Bourne, all of those. Bourne was, of course, a literary character. Robert Ludlum uh, created Bourne, but back in the day. Uh, Fergal Kelly says, I told you before about my friend who had his first feature in a festival in London. He's done a deal with Amazon US to show it. It's called Full Circle. Well, Fergal Kelly, congratulations. Anybody who, who does that and uh, gets a deal with Amazon, kudos to him. I hope you got a lucrative deal and that he's able to pay back his investors and anybody that have, might have invested in the film. I would love to do that um, with my own feature with Tango Shalom. Hopefully I can. We'll see. Uh, it's great uh, to have that done. Uh, I love hearing about people who get deals. Um, so that's congratulations. Please tell your friend. That is a, that is a huge deal when you're an independent filmmaker and you get a, a deal with somebody to make a film. It's a big deal. Speaking, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Mao, Jeffrey M wrote me another letter. Jeffrey Mao is a, a, a very active member of the post geek singularity community here. Jeffrey Mao says, good day, maestro of fun and wonder grand vizier of verisimilitude and all of his imagination connoisseurs. I would like to discuss today the topic of the unfilmable or difficult to adapt book or series. We've all read books in our lifetime, usually of the sci-fi, fantasy, and horror genres that in our minds would prove very difficult to adapt to a live-action format. Mostly, it would be due to budgetary restrictions as the expensiveness and visual audacity presented in the work would send the budget into the several hundred million dollar range. Also, the scenes described will be very difficult to pull off, even with an unlimited or nearly unlimited budget, simply due to the technology not being available to make them look good enough. However, I would posit that the hardest books to adapt are those in which the potential party trying to adapt the work would simply not have the will, the desire, and the sheer fuck it, let's just do this attitude required to pull it off. The author about whom I think this applies the most is James Elroy. I'm sure you're familiar with his work. I am. As a lot of people here might be, I have his latest book. As a matter of fact, needless to say, his books have proven difficult to adapt with LA Confidential being the most successful. Even that book was greatly changed for film. And while Curtis Hansen, RIP, and his screenwriter Brian Helgeland did a great job in adapting it, and it was highly praised by Elroy himself, it only showed how hard of a translation job it was. The book was part of Elroy's larger series of books, starting with The Black Dahlia, followed by The Big Nowhere, L.A. Confidential, White Jazz, the first four called The L.A. Quartet, American Tabloid, The Cold 6000, and finally, Blood's a Rover, the last three called Underworld USA. That always, you know what, that always, um, when he came out with Blood's a Rover, I, I couldn't help but think about... Um, uh, a Boy and His Dog, the movie Boy and His Dog with Don Johnson, because it's originally based on, I think it was either the sequel was going to be called Bloods Are Over, or it's based on a story called Bloods Are Over. I think Bloods Are Over was, and I was like, James Elroy is going to do the sequel to A Boy and His Dog? Anyway, Hanson and Helgeland wisely chose to adapt the book as standalone, so larger connections and threads between the other books were ignored. Characters who survived into the next book were killed in the film, a whole subplot involving the girl whom Exley rescues and a Walt Disney-like studio boss was cut out. The Black Dahlia was a disappointment, despite the great cast and unfortunately past his prime, Brian De Palma directing. It was a real disappointment, to be honest. Elroy's extremely downbeat tone, pessimistic portrayals of his characters, none of whom could be considered anything close to heroes, a fatalistic acceptance of the situations they are in, and a surprisingly macabre level of violence combined to make most of his books hard to adapt. 
don't get me wrong, these are the tenets of noir fiction, but it's like noir turned up to 11. The books that I would like to focus on the most that I think are his greatest books are the Gangland USA books, especially the first two. Elroy pulls no punches. He sets up a grand conspiracy between rogue CIA agents, the mob, anti-Castro zealots, the extreme right wing, Howard Hughes, Jimmy Hoffa, and anyone else who would benefit in shaping the history of America from the late 50s to the early 70s, primarily by assassinating John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. Elroy's patented three protagonist narrative formula is used to full effect in the series with the most fascinating character being FBI agent, CIA contractor, Kennedy operative Kemper Boyd. The role of Boyd would have been perfect for a 15 years younger George Clooney. Boyd was from Kentucky like Clooney and it would have been a very complex multifaceted role. Boyd was a Kennedy lover but ultimately turned against them and conspired to assassinate Jack. His affair with Joseph Kennedy's illegitimate daughter didn't help either. According to Wikipedia, Tom Hanks' Playtone production company was apparently developing an adaptation of Underworld USA for HBO as a miniseries. This was in 2009, and 10 years later, nothing has come out. This only points to the apparent difficulty in developing the project. There was also a previous option on American tabloid from Bruce Willis, but that lapsed also. The sheer size, scope, and audacity presented are already amazing on the page, but to translate that to screen is something entirely different. Elroy's distinctive prose style has no cinematic equivalent. His seamless interactions between historical and fictional characters is something that, unless done perfectly, would quickly destroy all sense of verisimilitude. Also, the at times unpleasant portrayals of the Kennedys would be controversial given how highly regarded they still are in the eyes of many people. In the end, I feel that the ultimate reason why none of and why none of Elroy's Underworld USA novels have been adapted is the simple lack of resolve to do so. No one wants to really accept the consequences, ignore them, and invest passionately in the project to make it happen. Look at Lord of the Rings. Many people said it couldn't be done, but Peter Jackson, Fran Walsh, and Philip Aboyans did a great job on the script, and they put everything into the project to get it done. Now, the Lord of the Rings books were read by and beloved by far, far more people than any of Elroy's books, and I think that makes a lot of difference. Adapting rings to films was something that many people could get behind and support, and it was something that they all wanted to see. Plus, look at the money that the Tolkien estate makes from selling the rights to his books, all for doing nothing other than simply being related to him. I don't know how much it cost to option of any, any of Elroy's books, but it can't be anywhere close. The fact that few people are beating down his door to adapt his books tells me that either he is a hard guy to work with, and he's admitted a lot of pessimism about that, or his books are just hard to get right. Well, I know you've talked uh, before about your experiences in optioning and adapting existing works to film, so I look forward to hearing your insights and thoughts on the works of Mr. Elroy. Thanks, Jeff M. Jeff, I'm a huge Elroy fan. Uh, I've read all of those books, and I do. I think your assessment of them is quite good. I was surprised. Um, L.A. Confidential was the first Elroy book I read, but I read it before I saw the movie, and the movie only represents a portion of that book, not just characters die that don't uh, to to not continue on. But L.A. Confidential is a much more sprawling narrative than the than the movie. I love the movie, but I think here's here's I think. I hate to say this, but the problem is when I was growing up because of James Bond, because uh, uh, of Star Trek, I, I as a kid, would I loved crime thrillers. I loved everything. I don't think that audiences now, especially audiences, and this is not me ripping on uh, people that are under 30 because I don't mean to do that, but I, I just don't think uh, making period specific pieces like, look, I love Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I love the fact that there's an, a, a comedic show that has Lenny Bruce as a supporting character. I think it's amazing. But I just don't know if you could get audiences that invested, older audiences, sure. But the idea of JFK's assassination and what it actually did to the country is not something that anybody, I think, under 35, it doesn't register with them. Um, unless they're Oliver F Stone fan people, I guess. It just, we, we just live in a different time. And while I do think, I think those books would be amazing for streaming, uh, 
Uh, and I think that we're a whole new generation of people because of shows like Mind Hunter. I think we are. We, we do have younger audiences, people that are tuning in and watching Mind Hunter, which is a, a period piece so far about the 70s, 79 through 81. We're going to get people that are like, oh, I I like period pieces that are that are interesting. And we need I, I would love that if 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 these were adapted in a in a big way like that. You know, it was interesting. I I'm a huge fan of of, of a, an author named Don Winslow. And he's written what I would say is the Lord of the Rings of Mexican drug cartel novels, The Power of the Dog, um, uh, The Border, and The Cartel. Amazing books. But I've loved his California noir books as well. And he wrote a book called The Winter of Frankie Machine. And Martin Scorsese and, and, and Robert De Niro were supposed to be doing this 10 years ago. And it's interesting. I was watching their, their um, chat at the New York Film Festival and they talk about that. And and Jane Rosenthal, uh, his producer, was talking about they were trying to make Winter of Frankie Machine, and it was a go project, and it was going to be a, a green light at Paramount, and then they they threw a monkey in the a wrench in the works, and um, uh, it didn't get made because they, they that's when The Irishman was first brought up. Really interesting, but there's so many books. Like I, Don Winslow's The, uh, the Force is supposed to be getting made, which is about corrupt, corrupt cops in New York. It was amazing. But I think Elroy's, it's hard because you ask yourself, what's the audience? The real problem is how do you sell an audience on this material? And when you're dealing with American history, like I love American history. I'm fascinated, especially the 60s. Um, maybe if, when a movie like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood comes out, now suddenly you can pitch it like, well, you know, it's like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but it deals with, uh, characters in the 1960s and JFK's assassination and it, that it, it's helpful. I mean, it's helpful when we have Mind Hunter and we have Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and we have more because the people with the money are like, who's going to watch this show? You have to ask yourself, what's the audience? You know, maybe you could pitch that to a Netflix because um, I, I think it could work. I think it could be great. Uh, people certainly uh, looking back, it's always fun to look back into American history. I, I would love to see more of Elroy's books adapted. Uh, you know, it was like John Cusack was going to do white jazz for the longest time. And it ended up uh, not happening. And, it, you know, it always bums me out. Look, I thought for sure, I thought for sure, and I, how naive I was, that my one of my dream projects, which was Clifford D. Simak's book, Way Station, which won the Hugo Award in 1963, which is basically an intimate story. Um, here, here's what here's what Way Station's about. Um, Way Station is a story about a man who fought in the Civil War, who was basically plucked, he was dying, and he was granted immortality. And the story takes place 100 years later. And an alien, it turns out that there is a, a vast network of, there's a whole alien uh, there's like the Federation. There's there's countless alien worlds, but in order to 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 travel, they have to build transport hubs where they're basically beaming people from planet to planet. And so, Way Station, they basically set up this human being is the only human being that knows anything about that. There's aliens out there. They basically set him up in this house, and it looks like you know a modest log cabin or a house, whatever. And and it's actually a way station where aliens of every shape, size, color, or creed beam in as they're waiting to get their next transport device or their next transport. They basically, so you could beam in at 9 a.m. in the morning and your transport time is not until 3 a.m. the next day. So our main character meets you and, and whatever your needs are. And these aliens are all incredibly diverse. They're not just humanoids. Sometimes they're sponges or whatever. And, and, uh, that's the that it goes from there and i wanted to make this movie so bad it was it was something i've wanted to make for years i've wanted to make this movie and i figured who's gonna know who's gonna want to make this movie because it's a to me it's a small intimate story and what happens is is that this man ends up being the deciding factor as to whether or not human beings earth is going to be allowed to continue on it's so great it's such a great story and of course last week matt reeves announces they're making Waystation for Netflix. So any book, 
Uh, there's no I, I I I think that anything could uh get made. I think anything could get made. Uh you never know. So perhaps perhaps the these books will get made. Who's to say they won't? Um but yeah, because in, in this day and age, everyone's looking for something to make. Uh it's crazy. Uh, Richard Green says, just support the channel. Well, thank you, Richard Green. I appreciate that. Supporting the channel is great. Uh, Willow Yang says, if you can hook me up with one soup from the boys, who would it be? And what would you do on a first date? What would I do if I, well, first of all, Willow, I, I, I'm overprotective. I feel like I'm your over overprotective older brother or grandfather, whichever you prefer. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if I would hook you up with a with a soup. Um, only because we don't, uh, I think Black Noir, maybe, only because he's supposed to be a ninja and that has nothing to do with you both being Asian. We don't know if Black Noir is Asian, but he just seems like he's probably got the most manners and might show you a good time. Um, I think he's all business when he's at work, but I bet he can party like a rock star. And I believe that he probably... Uh, enjoys the finer things in life, and uh, if he was gonna if he was gonna take you out, I would assume he'd show you a nice time. He'd take you to a nice dinner, maybe you know the almost famous stage show just opened up in San Diego. I really want to go see it. It got some good reviews. Um, it's it's two hours and forty five minutes long. I really want to go see that. Maybe he'd take you to a show. So I mean, I obviously Homelander, no, the Deep, no, I mean. Obviously, translucent can't do that, but I think Black Noir, you know, he'd be the choice if uh, it would have to be him. But then again, he could be a monumental douchebag as well. We just don't know enough. But I don't know enough about him to say no. I do know I'm not. I, I'm not going to send you uh, out to dinner with the Deep or Homelander. Uh, translucent, he seemed like a punk anyway. And of course, A Train. I don't know. Maybe A Train can drop the D. I I don't know. But look, he turned out to be a pretty big douchebag too, and uh, I I don't I don't like him. I don't like him. So Black Noir for you. And what would you do on a first date? Uh, when you say what would you do? You, so after I've already hooked you up with a soup. But on my first date, what would I do on a first date? Well, first of all, I'd have to know what somebody wants. Uh, wants to do but you know i always preferred on a first date that you could go do something with somebody and participate in whatever it is that you're doing like like going to a movie like john campia says going to a movie uh is fine but a first date you go do something to have an experience i think i think that the key to a good first date is first of all as a guy you got to plan it a good first date first of all uh, you got to plan it. You got to take charge. You got to plan it and be specific and go, here's what we're obviously you want to be doing something that both, both parties want to do, but it's gotta be, you go somewhere. Maybe it's something that requires a little bit of planning, but you go somewhere. And also remember if it's first date, uh, you gotta be mindful of how well do you know this person? If they don't know you very well, like, let me back up the, the Rob Burnett here, 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 here's the thing. If it's like a, a a real like a first meeting, like you don't know each other well, I always suggest this is what I've always told people: you meet somebody somewhere, you meet somebody somewhere, because if it's not going very well, you give her the opportunity to bail. She can get texted from a friend or a phone, whatever. Uh, you meet somebody and make it simple. You know, meet. I, I I once heard that brunch is always fun. Brunch isn't lunch or dinner. It's brunch. So you know that the, it's going to end. It's like, we're going to meet for brunch. We're going to see how it goes. And there's no pressure. Like, is he going to kiss me? I mean, you could, but if you meet for brunch, brunch is fun. Brunch is unique. You can go to some cool breakfast place. That's, I don't know, you read about, but you meet for brunch. And that way, the brunch whole thing can be fun. You know that it's not going to last long unless it's going really, really well, in which case brunch can move into the afternoon. You can see where it goes. But that would be a first date. Now, assuming that that goes well, a real first date, like a big first date, plan something, but make sure it's an activity you can do that you both participate in. And when I say participate in, I don't mean like racing go-karts or something like that. I mean you know, go somewhere, go do something like have, like go to cattle. Here we have Catalina Island. You can go to Catalina Island or 
do something that's kind of fun, some, something that's participatory that is sort of unique, that has some kind of novelty to it. That way, and then and then whatever it is you're going to do, then it ends with a meal. So you can discuss the experience that you've had and, you know, you get to you get to learn something about the, the, the person. Um, and, you know, if it goes well, then you have the opportunity to move move on. <laughs> but but there you go. That that's my idea of uh, as far as relationships uh, go. That that's that's my advice. <laughs> Jordy fifty four says. So is Joss Whedon consulting on Batman? Well, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, I. You know, I think that anybody, any any filmmaker worth their salt has people that they trust that they bounce ideas off of. You talk about things to people and see how it's going to go. And, and uh, but I don't know if, I have no knowledge of if Joss Whedon is consulting on Matt Reeves' Batman. Maybe uh, if, you know, I, I could I could see them doing that. We could see. Um, but I, I, I honestly don't know. But, I, but I, I do think whenever, look, anybody who's taking on the mantle of Batman is probably consulting with a few people. Cause that is that that's tough, man. That is not an easy thing to do. That is not an easy thing to do at all. So, yeah, I would imagine so. Um, maybe I don't know. I don't know what the relationship is like. Uh, I have a letter from Luke Beckett. Hey, Rob. First about my name. Yes, my name is Luke, like the guy in Star Wars, and Beckett, like the guy in Quantum Leap. But that's another story. Do you know how difficult it was growing up at the height of Star Wars' popularity with a name like Luke? <laughs> to this day, people still ask me to use the Force and still claim to be my father. And what is funny is that they think they're clever by being the first ones to ever come up with that. But since I was born, I must have been told to use the Force about 14 million times. So sometimes, anticipating the joke, I will introduce myself as Luke Skywalker and foil their plans. It is just funny. I also find it funny that in all of Star Wars, the only character to have a regular name was Luke. If George would have called him something uncommon like he did with Han or L Lando, I wouldn't have had this problem. But Star Wars has been a pain in my side all my life because I share my name with the main character. Since I love Star Trek a whole lot more than Star Wars, good man. No, it's not true. I like Star Wars. I would have preferred people telling me to engage or make it so like Jean-Luc Picard does, but that didn't happen yet. But yes, it is ironic that my name is Luke and I'm defending the Star Wars prequels, even though Luke is not in them except in the very last scene. So this is a reply to your comments that the, prequel, the prequels are bad movies, but good Star Wars because it has a good story. I agree, but I think that is where you and I also split paths. As you say, you are the gatekeeper of verisimilitude. I did not say I was. Somebody else hung that on me. I am the gatekeeper of great storytelling. Well, sir, we'll see about that, Luke. Because you cannot have a good movie if you do not have a great story, no matter how real you make the movie look. You can have an entire movie being one shot of beautiful landscapes, and believe me, in film school, we saw such a movie. <laughs> me too. It's as real and gorgeous as you can make it, but absolutely boring because there's no story. Now take that landscape and have an off-camera narration about what the landscape is and what it means to whoever is looking at it, and suddenly... You have a movie worth watching. That comes from story, not verisimilitude. So verisimilitude is important, but only to a point. I totally agree with you. That is why I can watch old movies such as The Wizard of Oz with its obvious indoor sets and its painted backdrops or the original Clash of the Titans which, with its stop-motion photography or The Phantom Menace with its pioneering but still evolving digital special effects. Look past it and still enjoy the movie because the story is so good. I agree. As for dialogue, yes, people don't talk the way they do in the prequels, but people don't talk the way they do in Casablanca either. Would you look at your girlfriend and say, here's looking at you, kid? Well, yes. <laughs> yes, I would. But she would laugh in your face. But you don't laugh when Bogart says it, does you? Do, do you? Maybe because it's me. I've seen so many old movies with the dry dialogue delivery that was common back then that it doesn't bother me. Dry dialogue delivery. But the prequels also take place in an era that is supposed to be more sophisticated and proper than the originals, and that kind of dialogue delivery to me fits. It's an interesting point. By the time we get to A New Hope, society is degraded, and you can see that not only how the movie looks, but how people talk. Can it be that George did this by design? I wouldn't put it past him. 
In any event, the story of a society and a man being manipulated by a diplomat with a second agenda and seeing how all of that unfolds is much more interesting to me than anything that happened in the original trilogy. So that is why I keep defending them. <laughs> but the question remains, which you did not answer, is do the sequels make people appreciate the prequels more? By seeing how some are clamoring for the days where George Lucas was heading his own movies, it seems they do. As for me, I will rewatch any of the prequels anytime. I don't care if I ever see The Force Awakens again. If I wanted to see A New Hope, I would have watched A New Hope. I did not need a remake. What do you think? Luke Beckett. Well, Luke. As I can see, you didn't want to open a kettle of fish today. Uh, good letter, by the way. Here's the thing. Uh, the, the prequels have lots of scenes in them that I like to watch. Like, there are, there are scenes in those movies that I enjoy. All three of them. Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith. There are scenes that I really like. Actual scenes. I like watching them unfold. I like the characters. You know, I, I just think that the problem, the real problem, the real problem, the single greatest problem with the prequels is that George Lucas was too far removed from mankind, from humanity. I don't know what world he'd been living in, but, you know, he'd been developing new technologies. The problem is you don't believe those characters. They don't talk or act like, like homo sapiens. And I think that's the problem. I understand where you're coming from, but the original prequel trilogy, if you think about it, it's about a farmer and a truck driver and an old crazy war veteran. So they, there's there's people that are analogous in real life to Luke, uh, Han, Ben Kenobi, and then R2 and 3PO are like, they're sidekicks, even though they're robots, they're, 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 they might as well, they're like, they're like farm hands. You know, and indeed they are. They are being purchased to being they're they're purchased to basically pick pick in the fields. That's what R2 and 3PO are. They're immigrant, they're they're immigrants that have come across the border to go work in the fields to make money, even though they're not, but that's kind of what they are. So you're dealing with salt of all the characters in Star Wars are like salt of the earth, and you get it. Luke has to work on his farm. Now, even if you've never worked on a farm, you totally get where he's coming from. Han Solo is a truck driver. He owes money to people. He might as well, whether he's a gambler, whatever, all those things, we get it because we've seen that kind of character. It's an archetypical character, and we get it. Ben Kenobi is literally an, an aging war vet, you know, that, that talks about the old days but is but is locked away. We don't know exactly why, but 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 so he's the grizzled veteran of foreign wars. And all of these guys are essentially blue-collar dudes. And we get it. We understand who these people are from the very beginning. The the we want to understand who Jedi are, and in we think we do. We've seen Yoda, we've seen Ben Kenobi up until the prequels, Vader and the Emperor. But what does it mean to be a Jedi Knight? We've heard about it, we haven't seen it. You know, we have not seen, and so when we meet Ben Kenobi and we meet Qui-Gon Jinn. You know, everything they do, we're like, are, these are Jedi. These are at the height of their powers. But even then, it, it, they're not that well defined. Uh, it, it seems like they're, I don't think George Lucas really knew. I, I also, well, that's, a, that's another thing. But I think that the problem with the prequels is that there isn't enough, the world building's there. It's the people building that's missing from the prequels. I just don't. I don't know who any of those people are. I don't know what their deal is. You know, when when we first meet Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, they literally show up, walk into a room and sit down and they're just like, "Huh." They don't do anything where we're able to understand anything about them as people, and then when they do go into action, they're generic Jedi's. We don't really understand we're, we're the only things that we know, we know about Ben Kenobi from the tril original trilogy, so okay, we know what he's going to grow into, but but who is Qui-Gon Jinn like as a guy? We don't know. And I don't think we know any of the characters. We're meeting all of these characters in these situations where uh, we're not learning about who they are as and I say people. I mean, who who are these people? We don't know. 
We're, we're not, we don't meet them. They're not fully developed characters. We meet Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon and they're Jedi. What does that mean? And who are they? Like, what do we know about, what do we know about those characters? They don't even have scenes where they literally, they walk into a room and sit down. And, and I think the problem with the prequels is we don't understand who any of those characters are. We understand the situations. We understand they're Star Wars people. But we don't know who they are. We don't relate to them as characters because even though Luke Skywalker is an archetype and Han Solo is an archetype and Ben Kenobi is an archetype, we learn about them. You know, I was going to go to Toshi Station and pick up some power converters. That means the whole audience knows that, oh, great. You know, my parents want me to do my chores and I, I want to go play with my friends. Everybody gets that. They're like, I get Luke Skywalker. He's just like me. The prequels don't do that. There's no character building. We don't understand who they are as people. We never see any. There's like no, I would call them civilian moments. We barely have any moments where we learn who those characters are. Even Luke going, this one's got a bad motivator. What are you trying to push on us? You know, Uncle Owen, what are you trying to push on us? We get a little bit of who he is. And I think the problem with the prequels is that we don't get that. We needed to learn who those characters are. I mean, yeah, we want to meet Jedi, but you know what? What do Jedi do and what do they talk about when they're not Jediing out? Like, who are these guys? If they're on this mission. I would like to have spent some time with them before they get to where they're going or at least see them doing their thing first. And I think that's the problem with the prequels is that we just we just allow those characters to exist without getting to know who they are. Whereas in Star Wars, you 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 meet you meet what is we meet Prissy R uh, C three PO. Did you hear that, Scaredy Cat? They've shut down the main reactor. There'll be no escape for the princess this time. We'll be destroyed for sure. There'll be no escape for the princess this time. This is a cowardly robot who bitches and moans and complains in the middle of a battle situation. He's complaining. So immediately, immediately, C three PO is in, in. In we're we're endeared. He's endeared to us because he's not just a, a robot. Like he's now a, a, a robot that's a scaredy cat who talks like an English butler. And there's all this stuff that immediately, wow, this is not what I expected from a robot. And and you like him, you know. And and how R two D two R two D two. Can't go in there. It's restricted. R2D's like, I'm gonna go wherever. And, and there you go. I mean, this this little spark plug of a robot that only beeps and boops. He's off on a mission. He sets out over the jungle and the wastes of Tatooine to find Obi-Wan Kenobi. I mean, it's all character building. I don't feel that you have character in the, in the prequel. That's in my mind, that's the weakest part of the Star Wars prequels, is we don't know who these characters are. We're getting a bunch of generic Star Wars cutout people, and we don't. He was meant to help you. What does Shmi Skywalker think about being enslaved to Watto? We never learn. She never bitches or moans or complains. She's just the ultimate mom. Like, what is it like living there? You know, he was meant to help you. That's all. That's something that some Star Wars character would say. I mean, I want to know about Shmi. Like, what's her, what's her deal? You know, we don't know. And that's the problem. Anyway, at least that's the way I see it. I think that's what everybody's problem with Star Wars prequels are. We want to like them, but who are these people? Uh, let's see. Uh, Stephen Foley says, hey, Rob, did you see I Am Mother? I assume you mean me. Man, hey, man. That was the Netflix show that has uh, Rose Byrne about the the girl that's living alone in the outpost. And then, and then, and then, um, uh, uh, Hillary Swank shows up. I did. I liked I Am Mother, to be honest. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I enjoyed the premise. I thought it was a really interesting idea. And uh, I thought it was great. I mean, I have always wanted to start a production company where I'd be, where we would be making lower budget genre fare. And a movie like I Am Mother is the kind of movie that I think we should be making. I like seeing that from Netflix. I thought that was one of their stronger entries. Unlike, say, in the shadow of the in the shadow of the moon, which I watched yesterday, that I had high hopes for, that started really strong and then completely spun off the rails. But um, bum me out. But yes, I liked I Am Mother. If that's what you're talking about, 
Um, I uh, the I hope it is. But if 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 it is, yes, I did like it, and you should watch it. It's good. It's a good. It's a good science fiction film. I I enjoyed it. Well, ladies and gentlemen. That brings this observations number 236 to an end. I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel and supporting me through chats and signing up over at the website, theburnetwork.net. If you like these chats, if you want to know more, if do you want to know more, if you want to join the uh, Starship Troopers, uh, please like, hit like on these chats, subscribe, hit the bell if you want to hear what I'm going on. Um, thank you very much. Go to the website, theburnetwork.net. All of the letters I read will eventually be up at the website to comment on and to share. And uh, I guess I can announce, well, I'm not going to say who I'm going to bring on board a columnist, a right. Even, even Mike Bodden doesn't know this, a columnist, a regular columnist. And she is going to write articles for the website. So we're going to have some new original content being created and somebody I've enjoyed on Twitter and I've liked her videos and um, uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but, I'm really uh, happy to bring her on board and have her regular column. You'll know more about that later. I want to thank my moderators, of course, Detective Jim, the Sheriff of Nottingham, Terry, Greg Smith, who can build a house with his bare hands, who's building a one-to-one -one scale snow speeder, and, of course, the Honorable Mayor Mike Bodden, who is back in his own constituency. Uh, he is back in Riverdale, Iowa. Um, he, he, you know, he really loved coming and bringing. I, I got to say, I'm still enjoying. I'm reading everybody's books and listening to Lynn's music and still putting stickers up. I, I can't thank you again for all the, the wonderful, the wonderful gifts that you sent me. And, you know, I would dare say it's, it, it really isn't my place to say this, but keep them coming. Cause that was damn fun to, 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 to share with everyone. And I was just so surprised at how creative everyone is. Joseph's pictures I'm getting framed. I'll have those uh, hanging up and uh, it's all great. And it just, it really, I really, I was very touched by that. So uh, it's great to know what kind of a community we have. So that brings this chat to a close. Rob observations number 236. And allow me to say, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell. You have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I bid you adieu. And I say, have a better day. <laughs>